Hey everybody, it's Halloween Maggie. Uh, no, it's Ask Maggie. Uh, I still have my Halloween ears on for my blender video, and I didn't want to take them off yet. So, you guys get the benefit of my light up glowy ears. Because whenever I go to a convention, I buy something silly, and this was this convention, and I love them. They're from uh, Geek Smart? Geek Start? Geek Star? Geek Star. <laughs> yeah, she makes them herself. They're wire frames in case I accidentally step on it. I can just bend it right back. <laughs> Okay, so Ask Maggie came about, um, I think, a week ago. I asked for some questions. I got maybe eight or nine, so not this is not going to be super, super long, but um, it was really fun, and I really enjoy kind of hearing what other people would like to hear about, and I have tons of vlog ideas, so this was just a nice excuse to do some content and chat with people that I love. So we will start with, uh, this is Sergeant Zim. And he asks, what theme or design space do you think is an opportunity in board or card games? Um, and so this is take two, by the way, so I'm going to try and say this a little cleaner. Um, I think that in board games, the one thing I find most exciting is games like Pandemic Legacy. Though Pandemic is not necessarily my game, and I'm not super thrilled about the Legacy thought of that, but Legacy mechanics put into like a stock market. How amazing would that be if you played Wall Street? Like, Wall Street the board game for like 9 to 18 sessions and you had to manage this giant stock market that just always changed. How cool would that be? And I also think for uh, the legacy games, there's also um, things like Consequential that I'm very, very interested in. This kind of blend of technology and apps and stories. Um, consequential, again, is probably a little co op for me, but we will see. I'm always interested in what Asmati has to do when it's not Meow. Not the Meow. Um, but I will keep my Motina for now and my shiny new innovation that's coming out. Um, I am excited for more Legacy games. Even Seafall seems very interesting to me, but I, I feel bad that they announced it so early in its development, and so they felt a little bit pressured. I hope they're taking their darn time. Uh, next is Bear Genome Project. Uh, that's Oh, that's Todd. So Todd asks, favorite Nizia? Least favorite Nizia. Um, and to be fair, I've only played maybe 20 or 30 of his 5 million games probably 600 by now. Um, my favorite Nizia is, ooh, it's tough. So in my top 10 games is Battleline, but my favorite Nizia is probably Medici. And I don't know why the distinction is there. I think I enjoy Medici very much as a game. It's a cool, neat little card game, but Battleline is just a better experience. I don't know how, I don't know why I determine, I, have those separate in my mind, but I, I do love Medici quite a bit. Battleline is a really interesting two-player, very replayable. My least favorite Nizia, and the only reason I'm giving this least favorite is because of how renowned it is. Uh, Tigris and Euphrates is so much better as an iPad app than it ever was in a board game. I'm sorry about having to recount the temples every single stupid turn, which is so awful, and when I played it, as a board game, I thought, yeah, that's okay. And then I played it as an app, and I'm like, oh, this is genius. So, yes, I think it came out earlier than when I started gaming. And if I had been gaming when it first came out, I would like it more. Me. I don't know. I just know that Nizia himself designs everything. He plays a game, thinks, I can make this better, and then designs a game that's a better version of whatever it was. So he doesn't have much of a singular personality. He's not a Feld. I can I can play a Feld and a non-Feld game and be able to tell you which was which. No problem. Even some of the Feld pretenders, I could still probably tell you which one is the real Feld because he has a style to his design. Whereas Nizia is a chameleon and he kind of just finds a way to make Pit into Weedle or, you know, like, like the games he makes are mathematically sound light on theme, which is okay, which is fine by me, and usually pretty singularly minded. But it doesn't have the Nizia feel to it. You wouldn't be able to play a Nizia game and whatever he was redesigning and tell you which was which, usually. 
Um, for better or worse. He's still a genius. The man is a genius. But I don't... It doesn't... It doesn't make heavy heroes. He doesn't. Uh, Suzanne asks, What's one thing most reviewers do in reviews that you wish they'd change up? Well, there's lots of things. Um, so, to, to be honest, I am not much of a reviewer myself these days. I'm more of a vlogger, which is fine by me if you want to make distinction. I talk about things and I talk about games and I know a lot about games, but I don't do the bread and butter, here's the game, here's the walkthrough, here's my review. And if anything, I agree with TC Petty where you don't need that formula. You don't need the introduction and the name of the game and how long it plays and then a half hour of rules and then 10 minutes of review. I'd much rather the chunk of review be the main portion. Talk to me about what you liked about the game, what you liked about the setup, what you liked about the rule book, or what you didn't like about those things. Tell me why I should play this game over playing something similar to it. Tell me what worked, what didn't work, what was innovative. Um, give me strategy advice. Hey, the first time you play this, you're not going to know how to value victory points. We found it's about four victory points to every action. Those are things I can take away from your review and be more informed than I would be if I read the rule book, which is, I think, the biggest distinction for me between a reviewer and a rule book. <laughs> so if I can watch your, watch your video and have a basic understanding of how the game works, great. If I can watch your video, have a basic understanding of maybe what the game is like and know what is good and what I should point out and how I should explain the game better. Uh, so that's one thing. I would like to see a little more diversity in who is doing the reviews. How long have you been gaming? If you've all been gaming for 30 years and you're a, a white straight male and that is your perspective in the world, then I think there's room for more, but I'm not sure what we need to do as a culture to bring that in, to invite others into our community of reviewers. And I think, I feel that I'm very inclusive as much as I can be, but I don't also know a lot of people looking to get into reviews who are looking for advice. People just dive in and they fail for a while and then they do well. And I wonder if there are people who could benefit from some one-on-one -on -one and some advice and some help because it is a skill and also marketing yourself is another skill. And so you have to have both. And you see people that are very good at both that do very well. So you see the Rados of the world, but it's much harder when you see the thousands of other reviewers out there. Uh, sometimes I feel like everyone in games is either a designer or a reviewer, and sometimes both. And I wonder, where are just the players of the games? <laughs> where are they? Everyone's in content. Sam asks, is the S and Jealousy harder or easier having been there? So in my last take, I waxed on this one for like 15 minutes. And what I'll say up front is that it is much easier this year having been to Essen than it was two years ago not having been to Essen. That being said, it is more sadness in not seeing my friends and not seeing my connections and not having my network and not being at a big, fun environment like that. Um, it's not about the games. Games you can get from anywhere. You can import games or whatever. Like, things will get to you. But it's about seeing, like, I saw footage of people hanging out in the hotel I was staying in last year and playing games with people I saw last year and pictures of all my friends sitting around together playing a game. And that's something I miss. And especially out here in the States, there are not a lot of opportunities for people like me to go see their friends that live in Europe. And all of my friends in Europe gather in one place. They go to Germany, they go to one place. I wouldn't even need to trail up and down the UK and like go out to Italy. I would be able to just see everybody all in one. So that part's a little bittersweet, but I still have my internet. I still have my friends here, so that's always good. Ket, who's now on Twitter, and everyone should go follow him. <laughs> what are some games pre-Catan that you, that you think have held up especially well? And unfortunately for you and me and my audience, Ket, I am not very good with dates. So I believe Catan came out in the mid-90s. 
I believe the Ticket to Ride type generation came out early 2000s. I believe Dominion came out late 2000s. So my thought of when things came out, I don't know where El Grande lands on that line. I don't know where any of that goes. So what I'll say is that Cribbage is still really fun. Spades is the bomb. Um, I think if you played it by its rules, Monopoly is not that bad of a game. It just has a runaway leader problem. Yeah, said it. Yeah. I don't personally own it, but it's not that bad. I would say my favorite pre-Catan board game is Pit, but I don't know that many of them. So if someone could give me a list of games that are pre-Catan and ask me what I thought of them, I could probably answer, but I don't know when things are from because I'm failing. Joe asks, do you like solo gaming? And if so, what game or games do you like to play solo? I do like solo gaming. I have a little more fun gaming solo on my iPad nowadays. I have not done a lot of solo board or card games. Um, I follow Gameritis Guy and um, Jacob Kuhn and some others who do some fabulous content about solo games. Um, I have a mission right now to learn Owner Rim, which is the Omniverse or Omniverse. Um, I'm going to learn that one very soon here and do a review on it. Um, I saw Sylveon from far. And I saw Castellian, which are all coming out soon. But I've played Ginkopolis and CO2 as solo and had some fun. I just don't find myself a lot of time. Uh, when I find time to myself, I do video work. And if I don't feel like doing video work, I sit on my couch and play on my iPad. So I, one day, one day I will take a long-ass vacation, go away for a month, and do nothing but solo game. Hunter asks, do you have any dead collectible games that you really wish could come back? Um, in all honesty, I haven't played that many of the dead ones. I've played Vitas, the Hobbit card game, the Star Wars card game. I've played Rage once, and I'm sure I've played others. Um, and honestly, the, the one game, because I know Vitas is back in sort of like a print-on-demand sort of way, so that's kind of cool. A lot of my friends out here in Seattle play that from long, long ago. It's the Vampire, the Masquerade card game. Um, but the one I used to play that I didn't realize was a TCG, I just knew it was kind of a cool game, was there was this, what was it called? I know they made a card game of it. You guys can answer below. But um, you got boosters and you would open them up and you would make them into ships. And that one was really cool. And then they made a really lame card game out of it a couple years ago. But yeah, the, the boosters that were ships were pretty neat. Heavy Cardboard asks, which I'm assuming is Ed, but I never can tell because you guys use a shared account. Uh, and ask, what's your process for deciding to pick up a game for myself? Is there an informal checklist you use in your head? Some some games are auto-includes. If it says Splatter on it, if it's Spielworks, if it's Vitella Cerda, if it's Stuff and Fouled, I'm not going to be that picky. There are very few times in my life when I would pick up a Splatter game and say, meh, what else? No, I'm going to be very interested because those guys go out and find the most interesting, innovative, heavy mechanics they can find and shove them into a board game. They cost a pretty penny, but they're generally worth it. The ones I have to really think about, especially, are casual games. I have a hard time finding party games I enjoy, so it takes me a lot more research. Um, I don't use a checklist in my head necessarily. I either read the rule book or I've read a review and watched a video or I've heard people talking about it. It's, it's very rare that I pick up a game I don't know about, so um, I suppose if I had more access to imports, I would have to read a lot more. But for now, there's the checklist is, do I know this designer to be amazing, um, like Kramer and Kiesling or something? Like, I, I know those are going to be great. And if they're not great, they're going to be at least good. Like, a Rudiger Dorn, that's the one where it takes me, like, a little self-convincing. Rudiger Dorn makes good, not great games most of the time. But every once in a while, it's Goa. So, yeah. It depends. Depends on the designer, certainly. Rosenberg, I would pick up most of the time. So, yeah, I, it just very much depends on the designer and if I've heard of them. Uh, Dominic asks, have you done a vlog on introducing non-game or game light friends to more advanced games? Um, so, when it comes to... 
advanced games. So this is what I hear from people is that when you get your non-gamer friends into games, you want to be very careful and give them gateways and give them things that they can latch onto easily. But honestly, it depends on the personality and that's a cop-out. But if you're going to introduce someone like me to board games, I'm going to play your Splendor or your Ticket to Ride and then ask, is this it? If you find your non-gaming friends are wanting to do something a little bit more, they, they want to stretch themselves, they're taking way too long to make decisions in a game like Splendor, or you're seeing them try and find the best possible solution, that might be a good time to introduce them into a heavier game. And say what you will, but Terra Mystica is an amazing introduction to heavier style games. I would say once you know Terra Mystica, it's more of a medium game, but for a non-gamer, that's heavy, 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 interesting and weird and cool, and there's lots of strategies, and there's asymmetrical powers. It's, it's everything you could want in a trainer game. And then when you know it, it's not a trainer game anymore. It's an actual strategy game. It grows up with you. It's like one of those toys where you take off the training wheels and it's fine. But Terra Mystica is an amazing piece of gaming. <laughs> amazing. Other than that, I could see wanting to introduce something like a diplomacy style game. Uh, the Game of Thrones board game for the Game of Thrones fans. Uh, there's that little, there's a, there's a little Mayfair game called Intrigue. It's a very interesting way of introducing heavy negotiation. Um, I would say one 18xx style game is worth your time. I am not the one to ask which ones to start with, but you could start on any of them. Honestly, for people, for a personality that's like me, you're going to intrigue them enough to not care if they do poorly. So don't be scared to just throw them into whatever heavy you've got going on. If you don't know the game well enough to answer questions or to teach it well, I'd say that is what you want to avoid. Find games that you know a good flow for teaching. Here's your objective. Here's your feel. Here's what you do on a turn. Here's things to watch out for. And here's your basic, basic strategy or something to avoid or something to do. And go with that. I. It, it really depends on your friends. But if you're, if you're going to introduce me to anything, it's okay to let me fail. Because I won't mind as long as it was interesting getting there. Um, yeah. Daniel Newman asks, does my butt look fat in these jeans? Well, one can only hope. And Aurora Summers asked if I was coming to Europe. Not at this time. I am going to work on that for 2016. Uh, if work can't send me to Essen, I might try and figure out a way to get there myself. I just have to, like, what I need to do right now is figure out something I can do to kind of sell my services like uh, Tiffany did these wonderful vlog projects and she went to Europe doing those and I don't know what I'd have to offer other than just like I could go and demo but I'm working on ideas. <laughs> I've got things I'm working on but you never know because uh, overall I can break even if I go with work and they can get all those games and cool stuff. It's just a lot of money up front for them to do that. Um, so when we open new stores like we did this year, it's just not possible. All right. I think that was all the questions I had for this time. If I did not answer your question or you didn't get to ask my e tag on that, I apologize. Uh, hit me up next time and I will certainly try to answer it for you. And to all of you, good night. Bye.